Well, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so here we are this morning. We thank God for each one of you, those who are gathered here, those who are watching online as well. It's been a good uh, two services that we had yesterday. Amen? Amen. And we're looking forward to a good service today as well. Good to have Brother Doug Odell back in the house, his wife. See Mike Helton back here. Uh, Mike's an alum as well of Clear Creek. Give uh, those folks a hand. Welcome them as guests to chapel. Amen. Any unspoken prayer requests, show of hands? Amen. How many knows God's able? Amen. Amen. Nothing's impossible for him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be gathered here today to worship you. Father, we pray that, Lord, you would inhabit the praise of your people, that, Father, you would just give us the strength that we need, Lord, to not fix our eyes on the problems and the cares of this life, but to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, may you today just breathe life into us, Father. May we worship you, and Lord, may your servant preach your word today in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, move in every need represented by every hand. Lord, we know you can do great and amazing things. Father, I pray that it would be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me say that with a mic. Good morning, Clear Creek. Let's stand and worship God this morning. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. Your creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty your voice. For what you have spoken on nature and science, follow the sound of your voice. As you speak. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. See your heart in everything you said. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. Creation still obeys you, so will I. To worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roll your grace, so will I. For if everything exists 
to lift you high, so alive. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praise is to fall shy. salvation you chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride on the hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you a hundred billion failures disappear where you lost your life so I can find it here if you left the grave behind you so will I I can see your heart in everything And a work of art called love. And if you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died. God praise this morning. So, I found out this uh, not too long ago that the song How Great Is Our God is going to be done three different times during the service. And at first I was wondering why? Uh, you know, why, why is it that God orchestrated three different people, including myself, to do this specific song? It wasn't until God really got a hold of me and showed me that true revival does not start until we have a right view of who God is and who we are in him. The version of this song that we're going to do is called the World Edition. The lyrics are going to be up on the screen in English for you guys. Becca and I are going to do songs in different languages. And you guys can sing, and when you guys sing along in your language, or if you want to try sing with us, you can. Uh, the Bible tells us that in the new heavens and new earth, we're going to be gathered around the throne, every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. And I don't know about you, but that leads me to believe that there are going to be different languages in heaven. We're all going to be singing one voice, every language, all together in heaven to sing in praises to our God. So let's sing that together. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice tonight Bush and I, big life and 
trasen jaar. Ze duurt daar een jaar. Ze duurt daar een jaar. Spookt haar beelig. Poorsen on haar spook. Haar beelig. De zon en ons naar spook. Naar spook. in this time of prayer. God spoke to us a lot last night and convicted me and a lot of other people of different things and I really I really want to just kind of emphasize what the pastor said. Have a conversation with God. 
talk to him and be open with him, be honest with him with everything that's going on in your life because he already knows. Just talk to the one that made you, the one that is the name above all names. So if you feel led, sitting, standing, coming to this altar, let's pray to the one who's worthy of it all. Sing this with us. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. See, I believe, church. Yeah. 
your voices now. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. Give God praise this morning. God, you are such a great God. God that, a God that is so mighty, that is so awesome as you would take time to have anything to do with broken sinners like we are, who have spat in your face multiple times, that you would still love us enough, as the pastor said, to even say anything to us at all. God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you so much for the grace that you give through your son, Jesus. And God, I ask that you just please just bless this revival service. Lighten us a fire that doesn't go out, God. That we can take your name to the nations. That we can, see, that we can worship you for eternity. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are indebted to those who've led us to worship our Lord in song yesterday morning and evening and again this morning. Thank you for your service to our Lord and to each of us. My heart has been blessed and encouraged. I want to invite you to go ahead and turn with me in your Bible to the New Testament and the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. In the church where I'm blessed to pastor, I've recently started preaching through the book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings going verse by verse. I want to bring you a message that I brought to our congregation just a couple of Sundays ago from the opening four verses of the book of Hebrews. Uh, the study that I'm presenting back home is under the title, The Supremacy of Christ, because that's really what the book of Hebrews is about. It is about the supremacy, the sovereignty, and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is better than the angels, Jesus is better than Moses, Jesus is better than all of the other prophets, priests, and patriarchs. There's none higher, there's none better, there's none greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have Jesus, you have all that you need to, to be honoring and pleasing to the Lord. As we move through the book of Hebrews, if you study it later, and by the way, uh, we have a podcast for our church's preaching ministry. It's simply called the Emmanuel pulpit. And you can find that everywhere that you find podcasts. People ask, how do you spell Emmanuel? We spell it the right way. We spell it with an E. And uh, if you ever drive by, that's just a joke. If you don't know, some people spell it the Old Testament way with an I. So look up the Emmanuel pulpit and you'll find this message as well as be able to track with us as our congregation moves verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. When you come to one of the closing verses in the book of Hebrews, the writer here, who we don't know exactly who uh, he was, some even conjecture it might have been Priscilla and Aquila, but he describes this letter as a brief word of exhortation. He says the book of Hebrews is a word of encouragement. So as he gives this wonderful doctrinal treatise about the person of Jesus Christ, he said, I've written these things to encourage you. And yet along the way, the book of Hebrews is punctuated with what are called warning passages, calling the people of God to give attention to certain areas of their life. He really rebukes them in several cases and takes them to task. You might wonder, you may ask, how could a book filled with warnings and rebukes also be a word of exhortation and encouragement? For that, I'm reminded of the story that the late evangelist Bill Sturm, you may have never heard of Brother Bill, but he was mightily used by God. And Brother Bill was the kind of preacher that he'd open up the Bible and everywhere he would read from, he'd take the scalpel of the Word of God and he'd cut you to the quick and leave you battered and bruised in the altar. Somebody asked Brother Bill on one occasion, 
why don't you preach more encouraging sermons? And he said, nothing will encourage you more than getting right with God. I think that is much what is on the heart of the writer of Hebrews. Because throughout this letter, he gives these warning passages. Taken in reverse order over in chapter 12, he gives a warning about refusing to listen to the voice of God. In chapter 10, he warns us about willfully sinning after receiving knowledge of the truth. In chapter 6, one of the most hotly debated sections of the entirety of the Bible, he gives a warning against apostasy and unbelief. In chapter 4, he gives a warning about the reality of coming judgment. And Here in the opening of chapter 2, the first warning of the book is the warning I want us to look at today. He gives a warning about the dangers of drifting away from God. And I'm labeling the message today a warning about the wayward. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand to your feet to honor the public reading of the Word of God. If you're on a smart device, I'm reading from the King James translation where the Bible says in Hebrews 2, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. I pray God would add a blessing to the reading of His Word as we take our seats this morning. April the 6th, 1909, Admiral Robert Perry became the first person reportedly to make it all the way to the North Pole. One of the most fascinating stories from his journey comes from the final weeks of that expedition. He, 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 he broke camp one night, got up the next morning, took his navigational readings by what we would call dead reckoning by the stars and he set out with that team of dog sleds traveling north as hard and as fast as they could go. At nightfall they broke camp, rested for the evening and the next morning when they got up he took his navigational readings again only to discover that they were further south than they had been the previous day. He thought he must have miscalculated their location. So he checked and double-checked and once again set out traveling as far north and as hard north as he could go. Broke camp that night, got up the next morning, took his readings again to discover they were further south than they had been the day before or the day before that. He came to understand that their team was traveling atop a huge glacial ice flow, one that was so large they could not sense that it was moving south faster than they were traveling north. And by the time they rested during the night and went to sleep with all of the calculations, they were moving in the wrong direction. Tragically, I find that there are many believers on the ice flow of sin, drifting farther away from the things of God than we are moving toward the Lord Jesus. And in this wonderful Baptist Bible College, may I simply say that one of the occupational hazards of serving Jesus, especially in a vocational way, is we can busy ourselves with a lot of things and miss the main thing, that is walking in close fellowship with Jesus. I believe that's what the writer has in mind when he gives this warning to the wayward. Now there are three things I want to show you out of these four verses. Write down this first thing. There's a command. He says, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Why? Lest at any time we should let them, let these commandments, let these things slip. I want you to notice that this drifting that he warns about is not a result of ignorance. Verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect 
so great salvation. This problem is not one of ignorance, it's one of negligence. It's not a problem of not knowing, it's a problem of not doing. They're not giving attention to the most important things. Like Admiral Perry's team, we can be driving the dog sled of our life toward the completion of a bachelor's or a master's degree, pastoring a church, serving on staff, teaching a Sunday school class, trying to win souls for Christ. But if we are entangled with the things of the world, and again, I won't go down the laundry list of what that could be, we can find ourselves drifting away from the Lord. We may break camp every night at Sunday school classes. We may break camp at choir practice. We may break camp at Theology 101. But if we're not careful, we'll find that we are sinfully drifting and slowly departing away from the things of Christ. In his commentary on this text, Dr. Richard Phillips writes, These Hebrew Christians were being persecuted by the Jewish community around them and the apostolic writer urgently warns them not to renounce Jesus Christ under pressure. He stands in this text like a lighthouse on the shore saying there's danger ahead. Pay attention to what you've learned about Christ. Like a smoke detector sounding the alarm, he says we must pay very close attention to what we've learned about Christ. Like a caution sign on the side of the road at a dangerous curve, he says there is danger ahead. Pay very close attention to what you've been taught and what you've heard because if you don't, watch this now, the natural tendency is to drift away from the Lord. Let me say that again. This is so important. There's something you must do in order to avoid drifting because drifting is the natural tendency of life. Last night, I believe it was, we sang one of my favorite hymns. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. One of the great lines of that Him is my testimony, and it's your testimony whether you know it or not. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Notice the writer of that great hymn does not say prone to holiness. That'd be a lie. Prone to righteousness. Lord, I feel it. No, you don't. The natural tendency of a boat is to drift away from the dock. The natural tendency of a boat is to drift away from the shore. And the natural tendency of born-again, blood-bought children of God is to drift away from the Lord. Can I say it simply? You've never drifted toward Jesus one moment in your life. You will never walk with God on accident. There must be an intentionality. And so the writer here gives us a command to think about some things, specifically things that he talked about back in chapter 1. If you notice in chapter 2, it begins with the word therefore. As good Bible students, you know the old adage that when you see the word therefore, you need to stop and see what it's there for. One translation renders this word as for this reason. He's just taught us some things about the person and the work of Jesus Christ And he says, in light of that, sit up straight and pay attention because if you don't, you're going to drift away from the Lord. Now I just want to quickly review some things from chapter 1 that I think will help us. What is he talking about when he says, therefore or for this reason? Well, number one, you and I need to revere the Son. We need to have high, listen, and accurate thoughts about the person of Jesus Christ. If you look ahead to chapter 3 and verse 1. Chapter 3 verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Over and over again, he's connecting sound doctrine about the person and work of Jesus Christ with how you and I ought to live. Daniel 11.32 is a verse you ought to commit to memory. There the Bible says, The people who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. 
We've got to have the right view of God that we might rightly live for God in light of that view. And in chapter 1, the writer tells us much about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And the main point that he wanted us to know is that Jesus is higher, better, and greater than any other. And because of who he is and because of what he's done, you and I should listen to him and give very earnest heed to what he has commanded us to do. Now most of you are not old enough to remember an old commercial that featured a a stockbroker and investment advisor called E.F. Hutton. But in those commercials, the There may be a busy restaurant or a crowded football stadium. Maybe a busy group of people out on the streets or the sidewalk and two people would be talking and and one of them would say, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton and E.F. Hutton says, and a hush would fall over the mass crowd and the announcer would say, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus Christ talks, His people ought to listen. In fact, in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and they listen to me, and they follow me. One of the greatest indications that you are, in fact, one of God's sheep, that you are truly saved, is that you give attention when Jesus Christ speaks to you. Now, how does He speak to you? He speaks to you through His Word and by His Spirit. Now, if I give you some advice this week while I'm here, I won't say this of your professors, I'll say this of me. But if I give you some advice while I'm here, you can take it or leave it. Because I'm an imperfect man with imperfect counsel and imperfect advice. But when God tells you to do something in His Word, you better sit up straight and pay attention to it. And you and I would better do it. These Hebrews that were tempted to turn their back on the Lord. He's reminding them what I want to remind you. Nobody's ever done for you what Jesus has done for you. There may be a student in this room tonight, humanly speaking, you need to know that there's, there are no human beings on the planet that have ever done more for you, most likely, than your mama and your daddy. And if you're not married and out from under their tutelage, then, then you better listen to what they say because they'd lay down in the street and they'd give their life for you. And in the very same way, Nobody's ever done for you what Jesus has done for you. That hobby, that practice, that that pursuit that is taking you away from Christ, it's never done for you what Jesus has done for you. I told my church a few weeks ago, some of you are about to forsake your calling and your responsibilities to the church to head up to Athens, Georgia, to Sanford Stadium to give the next three months of your life to a quarterback or a running back that won't ever even know your name and you're going to shirk your responsibility to a God who left heaven and earth, robed Himself in flesh and blood, gave His life for you on the cross, rose from the dead, forgave you of your sin and one day will take you to the glorious place called Heaven. The writer says if you're, if you're forsaking the Lord Jesus and drifting away from Him, you better start thinking correctly. He gives a command to consider some things. He says, number one, you need to revere the Son. But then there's a second thing that he says. He says you need to receive the Scripture. Again, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Now now this word hear or heard gives us our English word for acoustics. Those of you who are studying music, you understand the importance of acoustics. It it deals with that which is, is publicly declared. In this case, it speaks of the public proclamation of the Word of God. The implication here is if you are drifting away from sitting up under the public proclamation of the Word of God, or if you listen to it with the ears on the side of your head, but not the ears at the bottom of your heart, you are going to drift away from the Lord. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The psalmist asks, how can a young man cleanse his way? How can a young woman cleanse her way? For that matter, how can an older man or an older woman cleanse their way? By keeping it according to your word. 
This is why the writer began back in chapter 1 by telling us that God in times past spoke to us in a lot of different ways through prophets and through patriarchs, through signs and miracles and wonders. But now in these last days He has spoken to us in His Son. God has given us an absolutely sure word. We should revere the Son. We should receive the Scripture. Finally here we should realize the seriousness for in verse 1 He says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed. The New American Standard says we should pay close attention. The King James says we should give earnest heed. The emphasis is very strong here. We should give much closer attention. Watch this church. He he describes here using the word heed. It's a word that means to grasp a hold of, to grab on to, to cling to, to attach yourself to. This entire passage is bathed in the language of of the nautical world, of boating and of water. This is a person who realizes they've got to cling to something for dear life. Some years ago, my wife and I were able to go to Cancun on a little retreat. And I got out in the waters of Cancun Bay. And I won't bore you with all of the details, but it was as close as I've ever come to drowning in all of my life. My life was flashing before my eyes. I was literally wandering there in the water. If they would keep my body there in Mexico, would my wife have to fly home without me? It's amazing how quickly your life can flash before your eyes. The lifeguard ran out onto the beach and tossed out one of those life preservers. By that time, I had made my way back to a little bit of dirt up under my feet. I didn't have to grab hold of it. But that's sort of the picture that's being painted here. Somebody who realizes the danger that they're in. And they grab hold of something else because they know if I don't hang on to that, something terrible is going to happen to me. You and I need to have enough God-given humility to recognize that we're not cut out of any different cloth than any other believer that's walked before us. If you and I do not grab hold of the, the Son of God and the Word of God, and the seriousness of the things of God, we will drift away from the Lord. Charles Spurgeon commenting on this text said, It is a wonder that we should have the message of the glorious gospel in our possession and be so little stirred about it. Upon our eyes there seems to have fallen a strange dimness and upon our ears a strange dullness. Here we are told we should pay very, very close attention to the things that we have heard. A couple of weeks ago I was traveling as I'm traveling this week in and out of the Knoxville airport. From where I fly, I fly from Jacksonville to Atlanta to the Knoxville airport. And on my way home I'm going to drive back to the Knoxville airport, then the Atlanta airport. In the ancient world all roads led to Rome. With Delta Airlines all roads fly to Atlanta. Because of all this, I'm going to have four different flights. Most of the places I go, I end up with four different flights on my way there and back. And if you've flown very much commercially, you know that every flight begins the same way. There's an announcer that comes on, a $200 million jet airplane with a microphone that sounds like it's from a 1982 Dairy Queen drive-thru. But if you can make it out, here's what the flight attendant is saying. Please make sure that your seatbelt is securely fastened. The captain will take the seatbelt off, light off at the appropriate time. In the event of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, an oxygen mass will come from the compartment above you. If you're traveling with an infant or an elderly person, make sure to put on your oxygen mask first and then take care of them. The oxygen will be flowing even if the bag is not deflating. In the event of an unexpected landing in water, time out, an unexpected landing in water is not called a landing, it's called a crash. But in the event of an unexpected landing in water, your seat cushion will become a flotation device. And as I sit there listening to this, I look around the cabin and I find that there are three distinct groups of people. There are some who are already sleeping. 
There's some who are already working. They've got their laptops out returning that last email, already working on their stuff. And then there's some other people that are already playing Candy Crush. I mean, room sweet. But nobody, <laughs> nobody is paying attention to what the flight attendant is saying except that one person who's on their first flight. Everybody else has tuned out the warning. Why? Listen to me. I think there are only two reasons. And they exist for me as a flyer. They exist for me as a Christian. When I'm not paying attention to the warning, it's because I've heard it all before. Some of you have preached this lesson. You've taught this lesson in Sunday school. You've given this lesson to your children or your grandchildren. You've warned them time and time again to stay close to the Lord, to live clean with the Lord. You've heard it all before. You could give this lesson better and more powerfully than I could. You've already tuned me out because you've heard it before. It's old news to you. The other danger is not that you say, well, I hadn't heard it before. You just think it's not going to apply to me. This is for somebody else. I mean really flying from Knoxville to Atlanta an unexpected landing in water I think that's just not going to happen now if I was flying over to Europe that might apply to somebody else but it doesn't apply to me listen to me child of God this warning applies to me and this warning applies to you none of us are exempted from this commandment that in light of who Jesus is in light of what he has said in light of what he has done Give very close attention to what you've heard. If not, you're going to drift away from it. That's the command. Second main truth I want us to see here is, is a caution. The, the command is that we listen to this caution. Verse 1 concludes, Lest at any time we should let them slip. Now this word slip may be translated in your Bible as the word drift. It's an interesting word. It's the only place this word appears in all of the Bible. If you look up a reliable lexicon, you'll find that it had three primary meanings or applications in the ancient world. Almost all of them had something to do with a boat. The first meaning was, would describe a boat that was drifting away from the dock or drifting away from the shore. The second meaning would describe a boat in that day typically made out of wood. Watch this now, that had not been properly maintained. The natural tendency of that boat would, would be to dry rot and begin to crack and take on all kinds of holes and deterioration. By the way, what do you have to do with an untreated piece of wood in the water to make it rot? Nothing. That's the fastest way to watch it rot. Leave it alone. Leave it unattended. And it'll rot naturally. This word would describe a boat that was drifting. This word would describe a boat that, that was so rotten and deteriorated it would take on cracks and, and end up at the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of the river and all of its contents would be lost. This word was also used to come to describe really a missed opportunity. You see, the idea here is that if you're not paying attention and you're traveling on that boat, you may be asleep as a passenger and the boat docks at your desired destination, but you're asleep you don't get off and now the boat has gone on down to the next destination and you miss the opportunity to get off that boat. And so you have here the picture of drifting. You have here the picture of loss. You have here the picture of a missed opportunity. Here's the warning. Here's the caution. Drifting away from the Lord on the sea of life. Drifting away from the Lord and everything that God has deposited in your life. All the potential, all the opportunity is lost and wasted. Or drifting away from the Lord and the opportunity to do something for Christ passing by. In one sense this word could describe, describe being adrift, drifting. Another warning is about dryness. Another warning is about being distracted. With that in mind, I just want to take this little word apart 
and, and present three considerations, three cautions. Number one, watch this, you need to look at where you are leaning. Where you are leaning. Again, this word is used to describe a boat that was not properly anchored in the harbor, not properly tied to the dock. And the drifting occurred gradually. So gradually some people didn't even notice it. And I've shared with you, I think yesterday, that I will soon celebrate my 25th anniversary in the same church. I've now begun making visits to, to babies that were born at the hospital, to mothers that I visited the hospital when the mama was born in the hospital. I, I, I know these people. I've walked with them for a quarter of a century. I've seen many of them devastate their lives with sin and what we used to call being backslidden. We don't like to use words like compromise and backslidden anymore. Now we've gotten sophisticated. We talk about people that are at different points on their journey of progressive sanctification. Backslidden. Oftentimes it comes with a phone call, a revelation, a visit to my office from a broken-hearted wife whose husband has left her for another woman. It comes in a lot of different ways. But here's what I've discovered. Watch this now. When you see somebody's life, when you finally see somebody's life, including your own, devastated by sin and compromise, you're not seeing the sin and the compromise in that moment. You're seeing the ultimate and eventual manifestations of a drifting that has been occurring most likely for a very long time. I don't know if you watched the news over the last few months, but down in South Florida there was a, there was a building collapse down I think in Miami Beach. And a couple of weeks ago they came out with the initial reports. It was no surprise to me at all. The initial reports of the damage of that collapsed building showed that there had been corrosion and corruption and a deterioration of the structure of that building that had been going on for many, many, many years. And what we saw that, that tragic evening on the news was just the manifestation of something that had been going on for a very long time. The danger here is just drifting away from the Lord. Students, parents, faculty, warning to myself, give attention to what you think are the little things in your life. I'm trying to teach my kids that if you'll watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. And if you'll watch the seemingly small areas of your life, the larger areas will take care of themselves. You think it's not a big deal that you haven't spent time in prayer in three days? It's a very big deal because you're headed for danger. You're headed for drifting. I'll not soon forget receiving a phone call from a man who had been a member of our church. He'd gotten away from the Lord, lost his wife, lost his kids, eventually lost his job, lost his house, lost, we would say lost everything. I kept his number in my cell phone because when I would scroll by, you know, looking for other names to call, uh, it would be a reminder to pray for him, and I would on numerous occasions. Well, one day I saw he was calling, and I answered the phone. I called him by name. I think it surprised him that I answered the phone with his name. He said, Pastor, can I come see you this afternoon? I said, I'm actually out of town. I won't be back in the office till tomorrow. He said, how soon could I see you? I gave him a time. And he said, I'm, I'm just so broken, preacher. I'm just so broken. Brothers and sisters, I don't know why I felt prompted to ask him this question. But I called him by name. I'll call him Joe. Today I'll call him Joe. Joe, I look forward to meeting with you tomorrow, but could I ask you a question? How did all this happen? His words to me. I don't know, preacher. I just don't know. Well, preacher, that's not true. I do know how it happened. It happened slowly. The danger of drifting. Here, here's a caution. I want to ask you, where are you leaning? What do you mean, where are you leaning? Well, just real quickly, a couple of years ago, we had some trees taken down at our house. 
And when, that, when I got the price in for a tree surgeon to come and cut down trees that were right near my house, it was a lot more money than I wanted to spend. So I started taking some trees off that list to be cut down. One of them in particular, as it had started growing, was leaning about 40 degrees away from my house. Here's what I told my wife. I'm not worried about that tree in a storm. Look where it's leaning. You're going to face a storm in your life. And people are an awful lot like trees. When the storm comes and the waters rise and the waves crash, you're generally going to fall the way you've been leaning. Give very close attention to what direction your life is leaning. There's a second consideration and caution. Not just where are you leaning, but, but why are you leaking? Remember this word could describe that, that boat that had begun to take on cracks and all the stuff inside was lost. What causes a spiritual leak? What causes us to abandon taking care of the vessel of our own soul? I'll just give you a quick list and then we've got to move on. One thing is busyness. We can get so busy, especially in serving the Lord. We can just get too busy. Then there's fatigue. You ever been so busy all day long? You get home and there's not time for prayer. There's not time for Bible study. There's not time for that close communion and fellowship with your spouse or with your children. Busyness and fatigue. And then there's distraction, pride, carelessness. The reality, brothers and sisters, is that a dry Christian will become a drifting Christian. And if you are a casual Christian, being casual will lead to being a casual T. Why are you leaking? Where are you leaning? Third consideration and caution, what are you losing? Remember this word, slip or drift, described somebody that may have missed an opportunity to get off the boat. They missed their port of arrival. And the word came to take on the meaning of a missed opportunity. And most of the time, it was an opportunity that would never return again. You got any things in your life you'd like to go back and redo? Some opportunities to witness or to serve you'd like to go back and have a second shot at? Got any sins you committed you'd like to go back to the other side of them and not do them again? That's what the writer is describing here. Letting some opportunities go by, opportunities that will never come back. I've discovered in my life there are some things that once they come and go, you'll never get them back. A word that is spoken, an arrow that is shot, cash money given to your wife. That'll be funnier to you later in life. You'll understand what I mean. And some opportunities to serve the Lord will just never come back around again. One of my favorite stories is the story of Walter and Arthur. They were driving around one day in Southern California. Walter and Arthur were very good friends. And Walter was telling Arthur about his plans to build, a, build an amusement park. And he said, I've spent all my money buying the land for this amusement park. And he said, Arthur, you want to go ahead and buy all the land around my amusement park because people are going to come from all over the country to ride my rides and, and see my thrills. And Arthur said that was about the craziest thing that he had ever heard of. This was decades and decades ago. Arthur's name was Art Linkletter. You, you may not even know that name, but, but he would later in life say that the greatest missed opportunity he ever had is when he did not buy up all the land around Walter Disney's proposed theme park. There's some opportunities in life. They only come around once. And if you and I do not stay close to the Lord, opportunities for service will pass us by. Most of you are at a season in your life that the Apostle Paul describes in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that life of singleness where you're unmarried and without children. And he describes it as a season in life where you have a greater opportunity to serve the Lord in an undistracted way. That doesn't let us married folks off the hook. But I beg you by the mercies of God, do not let this season of opportunity pass you by. Serve the Lord with every ounce of your strength. 
There's a warning about the wayward. We see a command. We see a caution. Finally, we see a commitment. If we're to heed this warning and avoid this danger, there's something that we have to do. I want to reemphasize something I said earlier. The natural tendency of the human heart is to drift away from the Lord. You say, Pastor, what do I need to do to drift away from the Lord? Nothing. That's the best way to do it. Just do nothing and the drift will occur on its own. So what commitment do we need to make? Let me give you three things and then we'll head to lunch today. The first is a commitment to simple purity. Verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and, and by the way, this is a mysterious reference here. What word spoken by angels was steadfast and every disobedience to it and transgression of it received this just recompense? What is he talking about? Well, you don't get this primarily from the Old Testament, but in the book of Acts as well as in the book of Galatians, the New Testament writers tell us that somehow angels were involved when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. Now, now we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and ultimately it's the Holy Spirit moving in the heart of the men that wrote the Scriptures. You can find that in 2 Timothy 3.16. You can find it in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. But somehow in the, in the rendering of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, somehow for some reason God used angels in the mediation of those commandments. And here the Word of God is simply telling us to think back to the days of the Old Testament and reminding us of what we talked about last night, that no one has ever violated the Word of God and not received consequences in their life. Here he uses the word transgression. Now probably you would more quickly use the word trespass. The transgression here means there's a line that's been drawn and we step across that line like trespassing a boundary. Disobedience, of course, just means God tells us something to do and we do not do it. And the warning here is nobody has ever lived an impure life and not drifted away from the Lord. He admonishes him to make a commitment to simple purity. Secondly, he asks for a commitment to spiritual passion. Look in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now often this verse is used evangelistically. In fact, I have a sermon that I have preached from this text inviting lost people to be saved and not neglect so great a salvation, but it is more accurately in its context given as an appeal to those who claim to be saved. Notice the warning here is not about those who reject salvation, but those who neglect their salvation. They don't give attention to to it. In other words, in South Georgia we'd say they've gotten over being saved. Other things are more important to them than their relationship with the Lord. Now this word neglect is also used in Matthew 22 verse 5. There Jesus describes a, a master of ceremonies that has given a great banquet feast. And he sends out the invitation for all to come to the marriage supper. And in Matthew 22, 5, the scripture says they paid no attention. That phrase, paid no attention, is the same word here for neglect. They're giving their attention to other things. And the Bible says in Matthew 22 that they paid attention to other things and went their separate ways. One went to his farm and another went to his business. The bottom line is they had other priorities in their life. Now look right here as we begin to close this message. I know practically no one in this room today before yesterday. Blessed to have some friends, the Odals that are here today. They were members of our church and we had fellowship when Brother Doug was serving down in southeast Georgia. Beyond that, I don't think I've met any of you before yesterday in person. Having said that, I'm going to tell you something about you and it'll be pinpoint accurate. I'm about to tell you, brother, exactly how close to Jesus you are. In the sound booth, I'm going to tell you exactly how close to Jesus you are. 
I remember my brother Matthew, because I've got a boy named Matthew. Matthew, I'm about to tell you how close to Jesus you are. From the president of this great institution to the first time guest. You know how close to Jesus you are? As close as you want to be. Not one bit closer and not one bit further away. He asked, how shall we neglect, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What is the caution and the commitment here? A commitment to simple purity, to spiritual passion. Finally, a commitment to scriptural progress. The end of verse 3 and verse 4 are just a reminder that you and I have a sure word from God in the sufficient word of God. The writer wants us to know that when we hold the Bible in our hand, we have a reliable and trustworthy word from a reliable and trustworthy God. Now students and parents, look right here as I close this morning. If you want to stay in the word of God, you'll end up in the will of God. And if you get away from the Word of God, you will get out of the will of God every single time. That's where that road leads. That's where that river drifts. Now the best and simplest definition that I've ever heard of being backslidden or away from the Lord is to simply ask yourself this question, and I'll close with it this morning. Has there ever been a time in your life you're closer to the Lord Jesus than you are right now? Has there ever been a time in your life that you prayed more, read your Bible more, witnessed more, served more faithfully, gave more sacrificially? Ever been a time in your life you confessed your sins more regularly? Ever been a time in your life you were closer to the Lord than you are now? Well, here's the good news of the gospel. If you're willing to return to the Lord... He's willing to receive you. You're not a better sinner than Jesus is a Savior. He's better at forgiving sin than you are at committing those sins. 1 John 1, 9, I referenced last night, said that if we confess our sin, He is faithful. I've been unfaithful, but He is faithful. And He's just. I've been unjust, but He's just. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I will close with this brief story. Early in my ministry, when I would preach revivals, my wife and I, we would speak, and she'd say, how did it go tonight? How'd it go this morning? Brother Josh, early on, I was ignorant enough, inexperienced enough to give her an answer. I'd say it went great. Man, the illustrations flowed. The altar was filled. We had this many public decisions. Everything was wonderful, although most of the time it was more like it was awful. My thoughts weren't clear. The words didn't flow. Uh, the, The service was dead. I would give her an immediate answer. But the longer that I live and preach and pastor, the more comfortable I am with this answer. How did it go tonight? How did it go in the chapel revival service this morning? I don't know. The best way for me to find out whether or not we've had revival this week would be to check in with some of you in about six months and ask, are you closer to the Lord now than you were before? You and I do not give very close attention to our walk with Christ. The natural tendency will be to drift. And the writer gives a warning about the waver. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed in prayer just to remove any distraction. Is there an area of your life that you've allowed to drift? You've just neglected it. Specifically, when was the last time you got up in the morning and spent time in the Word? Has it been a while since you've had a fervent prayer life? Then pray a prayer offered by a great hymn writer. I've wandered far away from God. 
And now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. And by His grace, He will indeed open wide His arms of love if you say, Lord, I'm coming home. Father, would you oversee every decision made in every heart this morning for our good and for the ultimate glory of Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you for being here this morning.